Good evening, and thank you for attending. My name is Natalie Sayre, and I'll be your moderator for this evening's debate. Before we, get, we begin, please silence all phones and electronic devices. Additionally, please refrain from any interruptions to the debate, as it is being recorded for on-demand viewing and closed captioning services. The Citizens Clean Election Commission is the sponsor for this evening's debate. The Clean Elections Act is a campaign finance reform and public education measure initiated by Arizona voters and passed by voters in 1998. The system provides clean funding for qualified participating candidates who agree to abide by the Clean Elections Act and rules. These include contribution and spending limits, foregoing special interest money, and participating in commission debates. We encourage audience questions, so please utilize the cards given to you when you enter the room and hold them up. Our volunteers will pick the cards up and deliver them to me. If you need additional cards, just raise your hands. We screen questions for clarity to eliminate duplications, speeches, and personal attacks on candidates. The debate is scheduled for 30 minutes, so we may not get to all audience questions, but we will do our best. Tonight's debate includes two minutes for opening statements, two minutes to answer each question, and two minutes for a closing statement. We ask that you remain polite to the candidates and give them a fair and uninterrupted hearing no matter how much you agree or disagree with anything being said. Tonight's participant is Ms. Jennifer Jones Esposito, a Republican candidate for state representative in District No. 5. Ms. Jones Esposito, will you start your opening remarks, please? Yes, thank you very much for having me here tonight. Uh, my name is Jennifer Jones Esposito. I'm a candidate for the Arizona House of Representatives in Legislative District 5, which includes both Mojave and La Paz counties. I used to live in La Paz County. I live in Mojave County now. When I was in La Paz County, I was the two-term first vice chair of the La Paz County Republican Committee. I was the La Paz County chairman for the Donald Trump campaign in 2016. Now that I've met my husband and we got married, I live here just outside of Kingman, Arizona. I'm where uh, we are both precinct committee men in the Republican Party. We met at the Republican picnic here in Kingman up in the Wallapai Mountains. And uh, I hope to see you all at that event as well. It's unfortunate tonight that uh, my opponents decided it wasn't important enough to come and answer questions from their constituents. I really was hoping they would, and I don't know why they're not. But since they're not, I'm willing to take questions on any subject anybody would like to ask me. I'm running in this race because I feel I'm the most qualified candidate. I spent 10 years volunteering as the Executive Director of Legislative Affairs for National Dog Registry. Um, this job is really about reading and writing law. The legislature passes laws, changes laws. Sometimes these things um, end up as a popularity contest, unfortunately, and not always about qualifications. But I'm running because I feel that I'm the most qualified person in the race, and I was asked to run again by a lot of people here in my district. I ran in 2016. I got a lot of votes, didn't have a lot of money, but I'm here one more time offering myself to the constituents if they want better representation. Thank you. Thank you. Our first question, what would be your solution to the problem of Kingsman, Kingman's aquifer being overused, especially by commercial farmers? Well, uh, I recently spoke on this issue for five minutes uh, or something at the Legislative Ag, Water, and Land Committee meeting here. The aquifer north of Kingman cannot guarantee 100 years of water for the residents, which would include, you know, my grandchildren, really. It's their water. It's your water. Uh, one of the things that the County Board of Supervisors should have done years ago and the legislature should have promoted was we need an irrigation non-expansion area so that the uh, large-scale agriculture that's coming into the county cannot continue to drill well after well unabated. If they had done this, then there would be limitations on the amount of large-scale agriculture. I'm not against growing food. I am against foreign companies coming and essentially draining the aquifer and depriving residents of residential use. I think that's a higher use 
uh, to you know CAP and ADEQ, and I don't think that uh, Colorado River allotments and things should be allowed to be leased to entities outside of Mojave and La Paz counties. In La Paz County, they are in worse shape than Kingman is. The aquifer in the Rene Gris Plain near Baus is, has such bad subsidence that wellheads are actually sticking up out of the ground and the ground is falling down into the aquifer. So we have to at least start with an irrigation non-expansion designation, and then the legislature needs to work with ADEQ to come up with some new tools and options to address the specific needs of Mojave County. Thank you. Again, I'm going to remind the audience that we are closed captioning recording this, and I don't know as though all of you were in when I did my <coughs> announcement, so please um, refrain from uh, reacting positively or negatively to anything <laughs> that is being said. So we're glad you're here, we're glad you're enthusiastic, and here's your next question. Okay, you can give me a thumbs up if you like it though. <laughs> So we're going to hit on education right now. What actions do you believe the legislature should take with respect to educational funding? Well, the first thing that the legislature needs to do is address the funding formula. Anyone who's on the school board uh, here locally or statewide knows that we have a very, very convoluted funding formula requiring the school districts to jump through all kinds of crazy hoops to get a little bit here and a little bit there. Essentially, the best solution we'd, would be to scrap the entire funding formula and start over with something that's more equitable. In recent years, uh, we passed Prop 123 which sounded good, a lot of things legislatively sound good, but they have unintended consequences, and the money was not allocated specifically to classrooms, which left school boards open to give you know, raises to administrators or redo the football field, buy new drinking fountains, put a logo on the bus, whatever they wanted to do. Money is not being allocated properly to classrooms. The recent uh, legislation passed by the governor, again, did not allocate the money specifically to classrooms. Also, there was no funding guarantee for where that money was going to come from from the future legislators. So whoever meets in the next two or three years have to find funding for something that we pass because there is no funding mechanism. So it's very important for the legislature to make sure that we have the money to fulfill these goals and that we prioritize money in classrooms and, and in areas where they will really benefit the individual student. We spend over half our budget on education, but it's not necessarily going where it's most needed and where it should go. So what would you personally do as a legislature? Is there legislation you would propose? Is that something that you would want to participate in committee on? What, what would be your, um, your hot button issue? Well, the first thing, if elected, the first thing that I would do would be to form a bipartisan advisory group from people within my district. I have a friend who with a uh, special needs child who has a PhD in education. She's a Democrat, but she's an exceptionally smart woman, and she sits on the school board in Quartzsite. And I have a friend who sits on, who's a Republican, who understands the forming for funding, excuse me, funding formula very, very well, and she's a Republican in Havasu, I, I would welcome anyone from any party or no party at all to sit down and put together an advisor group of people who are actually working with this issue, with boots on the ground, who understand the nuts and bolts of that, and then any legislation I propose would come from experts. One of the important things about being a legislator or being in any leadership position is knowing when to delegate and not thinking that you know everything about everything. You have to listen to the people who have the experience and do the job. So that, that would be my first thing, would be to put together an advisory group and sit down with them and say, how can I help you? I have a seven-year-old granddaughter in the public school system, so I have a vested interest in seeing that we have excellent public education as well as educative choices for parents in, you know, Freedom's the answer, what's the question? You know, let's give parents the options, the education, the tools that they need, and get ev bring everyone to the table so that we can better educate our children. Okay. What do you think the legislature can do to protect Second Amendment rights uh, and ensure school safety? Well, I'm endorsed by the Arizona Citizens Defense League, and 
I carry. So for me, the phrase shall not be infringed isn't really subject to interpretation. It's pretty simple for me to understand. My, my attitude has always been if you choose not to protect yourself, that's okay too. If I'm there, I'll have your back till the government arrives. But uh, I, think that, um, I think that Governor Ducey's bill, his stop bill, which proposed uh, non-due process ex parte orders for people to undergo mental health examinations and we'll take your guns away until you prove that you're okay. I think that that sort of attitude flies in the face of the Constitution and that everybody has has the right to the presumption of innocence and has a right to defend themselves at any court hearing where their rights might be abridged. However, we also have a lot of veterans, a lot of retired police and other uh, service people who are qualified and we have teachers who would be willing to go through training and ultimately again that's a school board decision but I would not obstruct anything that would allow that. Moreover, right now on our publicly funded uh, college campuses you can't carry to protect yourself either. And I think that really needs to be changed. Most of the problems we have seem to happen in gun-free zones. There was an issue here right in this very room where they said it's okay to carry a gun, but you can't bring a pitchfork to a tax meeting. So, you know, we've never had a shooting here in Mojave County. Why? Because if you come to a board meeting, chances are a lot of people are carrying. And I think that, you know, that's, uh, that's not a bad thing for those who choose to do it. <laughs> All right, now we're gonna go to prisons. What do you think the legislature should do to decrease prison recidivism? I think that we, first of all, need to re-examine sentencing mandates. You know, a lot of times there are extenuating circumstances. Most of the women in prison who are separated from their children are there for nonviolent crimes. So, you know, you have, you have uh, programs where you you know have um, you learn skills in prison, but one of the problems that we have is sometimes we have people there for disparate amounts of time. You might have a violent criminal who, due to whatever reason, gets a lighter sentence than a nonviolent criminal, and in one may be more employable than the other. One of the problems that we have here in Arizona is the the private prison machine, essentially. Uh, you know, when you when you build a private prison, you literally guarantee I will put so many people in those beds. I will guarantee you, private crony corporate entity, that I will fill your beds for you and use the taxpayer money to do it. And when you do that, what you tend to do is raise sentences, make penalties harsher, make misdemeanors into felonies. Felonies lose their voting rights. They can't vote for me. I have a problem with that. <laughs> but we need to we need to make we need to not tie judges' hands. And we need to, you know, encourage some of these programs that allow people to learn jobs and get reintroduced into the working population. I believe I read just on Facebook today about a program that's doing such a thing. And I think that that's wonderful because someone should not be penalized at age 70 for something crazy that they might have done at age 20. Dr. Phil says when you know better, you do better. So when people know better, we should give them the chance to do better. And so you mentioned vocational training. Is there anything from a legislative perspective you would do to change how vocational training is done in prisons currently? Well, again, you know, it always, everything in the legislature goes to funding. So, you know, it's one of those things that you would have to deal with, uh, you know, with any proposed bill. I always tell people, I'm not going to guarantee you I'm going to vote for or against any particular piece of legislation that I haven't actually read. Because a lot of times things that say, I seem like they're wonderful ideas, the devils are in the details and they have unintended consequences. Or like the education bill, they have no way to fund them and then it becomes a problem. But I think that uh, especially if we're under contract with some of these private entities, I think they should be required to have vocational training. If you want taxpayer money, you better give us something for that taxpayer money. And as far as the, the publicly funded prisons go, I think that anything that we can do to encourage that within the framework, if the funding is there, should be encouraged. Absolutely. Okay. So next question is around small businesses. We are two years post the uh, minimum wage increase and the mandatory paid time off. What impact do you think this has had on small businesses in your district? 
Well, I think that the minimum wage part of it wasn't the problem, but it was the mandatory paid time off that really affected small businesses. This, again, was one of those uh, feel-good voter type initiatives, like, yes, we should be able to live on what we make. But it did tie the hands of a lot of small businesses, and it made them change the way that they did business. I'm not sure, if you were creative, you could say, okay, well, you're just not getting the, you know, this time or this perk or this benefit because now I have to give you that. My son-in-law is a small businessman here in the Kingman area, and he essentially, that was his take on it, is okay, if I have to pay this over here and it's mandated, sorry guys, you're not getting that over there. And unfortunately, that's what happens a lot of time when government interferes with with capitalism. You know, I think every employer should have the right to decide privately with them and their employees what kind of pay and what kind of benefits and perks they want to offer. So it, to me, it was one of those things that, you know, it was the will of the people. Maybe they read it, maybe they didn't, maybe they understood it, maybe they didn't, but it passed. And when legislation by the people passes, the job of the legislature is to see that it is implemented properly. So it is what it is. Not much we can do about it now. Okay. So if elected, what steps would you take to continue diversifying Arizona's economy? And what sectors would you focus on, especially for your legislative district? Well, I think that La Paz and Mojave County have a lot to offer businesses. We do have a lower tax rate. And at least at the moment, we aren't quite as laden with legislative burdens of you know, codes and fines and fees, things being quite as high as they are in some other areas, I'd like to see our county board keep it that way. Keep taxes low, keep regulations low, make it easy for people to come and do business here. Because we are so close up here in Mojave County to the Tri-City area, we have the ability to target businesses in the Vegas area, in, the, uh, in California, even La Paz County, 20 miles from the border, Quartzite, Parker area. You know, California is, is becoming very hard for businesses to operate. It's more expensive for them. They're looking for a place to relocate. If they relocate to Legislative District 5, we have the railroad runs right through here. We have an airport in Kingman. We have an airport in Bullhead. We have the ability to move products in and out for them. And as long as we keep it business friendly, I think we really need to be targeting California, using social media, saying, we love you. Come do business with us. We welcome you. How can we help you? So solar. Big topic in a sunny place like yes, Arizona. <laughs> what do you think the legislator, or what would you like to do with the legislature relative to solar? Well, when it comes to public utilities, which is the hot button topic right now, I don't think that mandating any particular new higher amount is the best way to do it. Again, I think this is a crony corporatism thing. Now, keep in mind that I am a, a number one proponent of sun and wind energy. I, had, I wrote an off the grid column for my newspaper for several years. I am very well versed in this. I am a huge proponent of rooftop solar and not necessarily even tying into the grid. But I think that if we, if, if technology is emerging, Things can change. Maybe today, one type of energy is more efficient and cost effective for the taxpayer. That may change tomorrow. But if we tie the utilities' hands and force them to buy one product over another, it may not benefit the ratepayers. And ultimately, the people and the entities should be free to choose the most cost effective way to provide that energy. And in the meantime, everyone who complains about their, their bill should try and get themselves a little bit off the grid, just a little bit every month, and you'll get there. I'm gonna remind the audience that we still are taking audience questions, so we have got about 10 more minutes of our conversation here. So if you do have questions, please write them on the cards and hold them up. So you mentioned for the future, granted it was around utilities, but I have an interesting question because autonomous vehicles are a big thing. <laughs> Right, so what's your position on states writing proactive laws for new industries like autonomous vehicles? Well, I think that states really, you know, whether or not states should be writing laws for industry in and of itself is an issue. 
You know, I'm a Goldwater Republican. I take the approach that before I decide if any legislation is needed, I have to first determine whether or not it's constitutional. So, you know, every, everybody likes to lump things into that whole, you know, oh, it's for the benefit of the public. It's okay that we can do it. You know, for instance, we, we do have public safety laws, and, and that is obviously in the public interest. So, you know, we have laws, say, for bicycles. Well, now we have a lot of people with electric scooters. I happen to have one. If I'm elected, you might see me zipping around the Capitol on my electric scooter. And there's been some talk about legislating that, or, you know, as far as where they can ride and where they can't ride. I'm kind of opposed to that since I ride an electric scooter. But I really don't think it's the government's place to promote industry. I think that if industry has a great idea, it will succeed on its own merit or fail. And it's not really the job of the government to support new industries. I think that we need to let the market decide what is the absolute best thing to do because I don't really think that it's constitutional. Now, if there's a way that we can bring new industry here as far as jobs, that's another story. I would welcome any company, any emerging technology that would want to come here and do business, but if they're expecting to slide me a bill and give me a gift and I'm going to run that bill, that's not going to happen. <laughs> So you mentioned safety. I'm going to bring up one that's uh, for Arizona and other border states important. What actions do you think the legislature should take relative to protecting Arizona's borders? Well, a lot of people who um, want to talk about the border probably haven't been that close to the border. Now, when I was in Quartzsite, we were within 100 miles of the border, and I would go to Yuma fairly frequently. I had a lot of friends who would go to Algodones because it was cheaper to fill their prescriptions there or cheaper, cheaper to get their dental work done there. It's literally sort of a dental vacation location. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I never heard any real problems. Algodones is fairly safe. There are other places that aren't. Mm -hmm. But that being said, Quartzsite is within uh, the 100 mile zone of what they call a colonia. So some different rules apply, and we would see ice trucks and things parked there. One of the things that I think we should be doing is instead of militarizing our police force and giving old um, military equipment, to, you know, I know, I'm not sure that Kingman PD needs an MRAP, but we should be maybe putting those things on the border. We have the Arizona National Guard, and even though they don't ha necessarily have the ability to patrol the border, what they do have the ability to do is when they do their training every year, they should be doing it on the border. As, as these groups train, their mere presence and using this surplus equipment would certainly be an excellent deterrent. Another thing no one talks about statutorily, the governor is allowed to call up a state militia to protect the border. Governor Ducey doesn't seem to have the courage to do it. It was Governor Brewer that did it. So maybe Governor Bennett might have the ability <laughs> or the backbone to see that that happens. But it's very, very important that we protect our border, and anyone who doesn't think so should tear down the fence around their house. So what do you think the legislature can do to address the opioid crisis and other drugs that are coming into the, the state? Well, this is another thing that recently came into the news in Mojave County because Mojave County has a pain management clinic that services the tri-state area. We have, in both La Paz and Mojave County, a high population of elderly people, retired people, snowbirds, a lot of people who are on pain medication for very legitimate reasons. So recently, um, <clears throat> you know, there's a lot of public feel-good, knee-jerk reaction legislation. We must do something about there's a crisis. I'm going to be the one to solve the crisis. But the, the main things that are causing this are things like poverty and, as you said, recidivism. Uh, you know, there's a lot of issues that are not being addressed. And there isn't probably enough um, treatment programs provided through health care to really address people's problems when they do have a problem without the stigma attached to it. So, you know, recently, again, uh, Governor Ducey made a big thing and pointed his finger at Mojave County as a hotbed of opioid abuse, when in fact, it's really, we have people coming from California, from Needles, people coming from Vegas to the pain clinic, and a lot of those people reached out through social media and said, hey, 
this is hurting me. I have a legitimate prescription. I have a legitimate thing. It's interfering with the doctor-patient relationship, and I don't think that politicians should be deciding what doctors should be doing. But I think that we need to provide more support services so that people who do get into trouble have the ability to get out of trouble. Thank you. So next question, in light of the recent events at the legislature, how would you help reform the current environment to address sexual misconduct allegations? <laughs> yes, this was one I followed on social media. Well, let me start by saying if I go to Phoenix, I'm not the girl you want to hit on. Okay, and that's not just because my husband's a feisty little Italian guy sitting in the back row either. <laughs> he will come to the Capitol, he will find you, but not after, until after I've gotten done with you. That being said, um, you know, what I find happens in government is what's allowed to happen in government. Things don't happen overnight. If this has been a problem, I can guarantee you it's been an ongoing problem. Now, when I was in Quartzsite, I spent six years exposing government corruption. I used my newspaper to do it. I suffered a lot of retaliation for it, but I was vindicated, and I won in the end for one very good reason. We recorded everything. I mean, er I trained everyone. This was before everybody had a smartphone even. We all got recorders, and we recorded things. So, you know, it's not a he said, she said, if it's film at 11 or it's on YouTube or something like that. So if you're going to have interactions with someone who makes you feel uncomfortable, you might want to do it in a public place next to a camera and a microphone. I'm just saying, smart women cover themselves. And, you know, I'm sure that there are probably some guys who get, you know, flirted with too. Maybe we don't hear about that so much. But I have a zero tolerance policy for harassment, and I'm just going to say that up front. I'm not your girl. <laughs> All right, this will be the final question before we go into your closing statement. So the okay. last question I have is, okay. what will you do to create bipartisan support and cooperation of not only parties, but also the urban and rural districts in the legislature? Well, it was actually um, House Majority Whip Kelly Townsend who kind of suggested that I run. <clears throat> Now, when I was in Quartzsite, we had a, a, something called a Liberty Fest, and uh, Judy Burgess, Kelly Townsend, Carl Seal, they all came and marched with the street, in the streets with me on a very hot day in August in support of uh, our police officers who blew the whistle on corruption. So I actually have some friends in the legislature currently. I, you know, I figure they probably you know, know some people they can help me sort of navigate as a freshman legislator. But I also have friends across the political spectrum. I have friends who are Democrats. I have friends who are independents. I have friends that are anarchists. We don't agree on everything, but we can always seem to find something that we agree on. And one thing I don't do is block people on social media who disagree with me. I hear them out. I give them their chance to speak because good ideas can come from places Sometimes you don't even expect them. And people that you might think you share nothing in common with may have a point that you hadn't thought of or information you didn't know, and you have to be open to that. So given that you know, I have no problem talking to and working with those people on whatever issues we might have in common, things like water, things like education, things like energy, I welcome sitting down with anybody across the aisles who wants to work for the good of the people of Arizona and, and I don't think that the Constitution and, and the, the things that benefit the people should ever be partisan issues. I think we should all be there to work for the good of the people. We may not always agree on how that's done, but we have an obligation as legislators to do that and not make it, pardon my French, a pissing contest between left-right ideology. My ideology is firm, and I'm prepared to defend it, but I'm prepared to work with anybody who will work with me. Thank you. Would you like to share your closing statement now? Sure. <laughs> Again, I, I thank, uh, thank you for having me, and I do regret that the other candidates didn't think this was important enough to show up tonight, but that's okay. Um, I hope everyone will uh, go to my website. I am a fiscally conservative grassroots candidate who is not uh, beholden to any special interests. My website is tinyurl.com backslash elect Esposito. 
You can find me on Facebook, you can find me on Twitter, and you can find me on LinkedIn if you want to see my resume. Um, I think you really should take a look at what, I made my own website, so nobody's speaking for me. I answer my own phone, I don't have paid staff. Uh, but, you know, look at my positions. I'm, in, I'm the only candidate in my race endorsed by the Republican Liberty Caucus, and I'm not even a member of the Republican Liberty Caucus, so I didn't pay for that endorsement. I just want that to be known. Um, I've been endorsed by local leaders such as uh, the former mayor of Kingman, a couple of Bullhead City Councilmen, former presidential candidate Tom Tancredo. There's a lot of people who know that I can do this job and believe that I can do it better than the people that I'm running against. And you know, this isn't about me. I'm not running because I want a title or prestige. And I'm certainly not enthralled with the low legislator's pay that comes with it or leaving my husband and my pony. I'm doing this because there are very specific bills that I'd like to run and things that I'd like to see done. And I just don't have the faith that Mr. Mosley or Mr. Biasucci will get us there. So I'm offering my services to the people of this district. If you voted for me last time, I hope I have your vote again. If you didn't vote for me last time, I hope I will earn your vote. And if I don't earn your vote, I hope you will take me right back out because that's what I would do as a voter. Thank you very much for coming tonight. Thank you for watching this video when you watch it. And please feel free to contact me. I will personally answer you. Have a great evening. Well, and we thank you so much for participating in our forum. And to our audience members, we thank all of you who took the time to come to inform yourselves before voting. We encourage you to visit www.azcleanelections.gov slash voter dashboard for a customized experience to find information on the primary election, the candidates, the issues, and to view this debate on demand. Please fill out the debate evaluation form and return it to one of our volunteers. Your feedback is important to the commission and will help improve future debates. Thank you all for coming tonight and you are welcome to stay and speak directly with our candidate.